thank you very much for the, the invitation. Uh, it's very nice to to speak at this uh, this great seminar. Uh, so the the point of the presentation is to talk about some uh, some application of uh, a theory called uh, multiplicative chaos to uh, in relation to random matrices. And uh, and because maybe uh, people are not so familiar with uh, what is multiplicative chaos, I will I will start by uh, by reviewing the theory, and in particular uh, try to explain where this type of picture you see here come from. Uh, then I will, uh, I mean, then I want to mention some applications. So of course there are many, and uh, and I choose to to discuss uh, the Gini ensemble because it's perhaps uh, one of the most natural one actually in this context. And uh, and then I will discuss some other things which are known uh, towards the end. Uh, okay. So if you have uh, any question during the presentation, don't uh, uh, hesitate to to ask. Uh, I won't check the. Uh, the chat, but uh, maybe Guillaume or Laure can let me know if somebody asks a question there. Okay, so right, so I want to uh, to start by uh, reviewing uh, or explaining what is a uh, Gaussian multiplicative chaos or GMC. Uh, so in the simplest setting, uh, and uh, and here, so what we do is uh, is we consider dyadic intervals. So I mean, you you have the grid. That's uh, uh, the square, sorry, and then you divide it into uh, into intervals. So uh, this would be uh, here uh, in my notation. This is like, uh, uh, in fact, this is t1, and then you divide it into again a smaller interval. That's t2, and for each one of those little square here, you uh, give yourself a. Uh, uh, a normal random variable. They are all independent, okay? Uh, standard Gaussian. And uh, and 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 the, what we consider is this uh, this random function here. So H n uh, at the point x is just the sum over all the 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 variable random variable x q for all the square which uh, contain x. And you stop at some level n. So you have exactly uh, n terms. And uh, and the first thing to say about this function is that uh, you see there are some positive correlation here. Uh, why? Because if you take two two points which are in different square, you know they will sh sh still share some common uh, common random variable here. In fact, there is a, a natural branching structure which comes from the dyadic cube in this model. Uh, so let me show you a picture uh, of what this is, uh, type of function look like. So this is a uh, this is H5, so here uh, there are in fact two to the five cubes, and uh, and and this is somehow well the, the the value of the function here is discrete, and it uh, it doesn't take remarkably large value, uh, but it's it's very rough in fact. Uh, it alternates between negative and positive value quite quickly, and uh, uh, and and this is what you see for uh, two to the eight cube. So and uh, and it, you can see that when uh, when the number of uh, cube tends to infinity, it becomes a sort of very rough function, very spiky. Um, and as I said, so this this model here, uh, if you should just look at for fix x, it's it's just a random walk, so a sum of Gaussian random variable. And uh, and for different x, there is this uh, hierarchical or branching structure. So they share common increments at the beginning, and then uh, when the cubes when x and y lives in different cubes, they, they have independent increments. Okay, so and and so what do we want to do here is uh, is we want to understand what is somehow the geometry of this function. So of course it's it's very rough. So there are many questions you can ask, and what we what we want to consider or I want to consider in this talk is what are the extreme values. So for example, uh, what is uh, the behavior of the maximum when n tends to infinity? Or what is uh, the dimension of the set where the function is uh, relatively large, etc. Okay, and uh, and to do that, you can uh, actually associate a measure to this function. So this is where the name random energy model comes from. In fact, I mean this model uh, branching random walk. Uh, it it came before Derrida, but Derrida was the first person I, I, to look look at this, uh, this this process as a random energy model. And what he did is uh, 
he considered just uh, he takes the exponential you know like a physicist would do you take exponential of gamma times a function and that gives you a sort of deep measure associated with the energy and you should think of gamma here as being a sort of inverse temperature uh, and okay it turns out that you need to renormalize and uh, and the way one way to do it is to just divide by the expectation here uh, and uh, okay, so so this uh, this is uh, such that uh, expected value of mu and gamma, in fact, is just dx. Okay, this uh, with this normalization, and uh, moreover, because I am in the Gaussian setting, uh, you can just you know rewrite it in this way. Uh, so uh, right, and uh, and the question we want to ask is. Uh, what is a okay, does this object converge uh, as n tends to infinity and uh, it, and this is particularly interesting because you see uh, for I mean depending on gamma you will capture some how the extreme value of HN because uh, this will concentrate I mean naturally this, this factor goes to zero very fast and all that will survive here is is a large value of HN in principle so here is uh, somehow the the theorem. So it goes back to, uh, I mean, Kahn and, and Kahn and Perrier, uh, Mandelbrot too, in fact, in the 70s, were the first people to, to study this, uh, this sort of uh, process here, this exponential of branching random work. And what they show is that uh, there is a limit, uh, almost surely in this case, and the limit is a random measure. Uh, and uh, well, it's called this Gaussian multiplicative chaos measure, and uh, and 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 the theorem is uh, shows the existence of the limit, and it, it more or less says it, it also says that the limit is non-trivial, in the sense that it's 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 non-zero and random, if and only if this parameter gamma is less than a certain critical value. So this this particular value here is for this specific model. I mean, it, it has to do with the DID cube. I'll give a more general. I'll explain what the critical value is in general uh, later on. Okay, so just uh, a few words about this theorem. Uh, so the convergence is easy because uh, uh, mu n is actually a, a martingale. So it's a measure valued martingale with respect to the filtration of, of my cubes. So uh, this is, uh, okay, this is why the limit exists and, and it's a bit, uh, you need some, to show some uniform integrability to conclude that the limit is non-trivial and the convergence is so old in L1, not only L1, surely, in fact. Uh, and, uh, okay, it's, it's a bit, uh, it's a non-trivial result because if you think of the limit of HN itself, uh, this, uh, this sort of uh, function that I showed you, uh, you can compute what is its covariance and what you will see is that um, here there is a log singularity. Uh, so it's not true for all x, y because of the discrete structure of the cube, but for generic points, there is a log singularity. So it, it, it explodes when the point gets together. So in other words, what I want to say is that the limit h infinity uh, is not a proper function. It's, uh, you have to view it as a random distribution if you want. Uh, and in particular, exponential of gamma h infinity does not make uh, a priori any sense because you cannot take a nonlinear function of a distribution. Okay. and. Uh, Right, and and this type of uh, random generating functions they are called uh, log coordinated fields. Uh, there are many others important examples. We will see a few. Okay, so here is some some picture of what this uh, this GMC measures look like. Of course, it's uh, some picture of the realization uh, of sorry of some the approximation. So here it's again uh, two to the five cubes, and what you you can see is that uh, so the the measure uh, it really concentrates on some somehow some cubes. So some cubes will get very high value, those red cubes here, and the measure tends to zero or is really small everywhere else. And this is really uh, what you see here. And the intuition is that those those, those high spikes here should carry some information about the high level set or the maximum of the functions. Okay, so let me be a bit more general now. Um, and, and just uh, say what, what happened in the general case, because uh, in the Gaussian setting, uh, the general case is very well understood, I mean. So, so I take a, I, I now take a function X, or a function, a process X, which is Gaussian, and log correlated. Log correlated means that uh, it's a random distribution, 
and its kernel, in a sense, has a logarithmic singularity on the diagonal. And this O of 1 here needs to be uniform in some way. Okay. And, uh, and then there is a, a theorem. Uh, so this goes back again to the work of Kahn, but really in this context that I'm presenting, it, it first appeared in the paper of Rober and, and Vargas in 2010. Then Rod and Vargas studied those, uh, those uh, GMT measures a lot, and, and there are other uh, people involved. So anyway, the point is uh, you want to define again, uh, formally you want to define the exponential of X. And you do it by your renormalization procedure, which is more or less the same as the one I presented for the this branching model or this cascades model. And the way you do it is uh, now uh, you construct an approximation of the field X epsilon here, uh, and you do it by uh, just uh, convolving uh, with a smooth modifier. So a modifier here is a function which is positive and it's a, it's a probability density function, okay? You can assume it as compact support, for example. That also helps usually. You take the convolution at the scale epsilon, and then you will take epsilon to zero, okay? And the result is that uh, uh, now for all gamma, so for all gamma uh, less than the critical value, which, which is really universal, it only depends on the dimension. Uh, D is the dimension of my space, I'm on RD, okay? And uh, then this, uh, this uh, exponential of gamma x epsilon renormalized by its expectation, it will converge to a, a limiting measure. And this measure, uh, the convergence now is in probability. Uh, this measure is uh, non-trivial in this regime that I, I put in red. And, uh, and okay, its expectation is just a Lebesgue measure. Um, Right, so this is really a convergence result. Now you can say a lot about the property of those measures as well. Uh, and uh, for example, many things are known. So it's known that uh, in this, so this is called the subcritical regime. Ah. Or phase. I won't talk about what happened in the, uh, you, you, you can do similar construct or other construction when gamma is greater than this uh, value square root of 2d, but I won't discuss it. So in this subcritical phase, it's known that those measures are of no atoms. Uh, so they are, uh, in fact, they are singular continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Uh, okay. I, Okay, this is not to do with the measure, but this is really some intuition about this process here, uh, how you should think of it. So uh, this process X epsilon, if you do a time change more or less, and you let epsilon be exponential minus T, you should really think of this as being a branching Brownian motion. I mean, this is the analogy with the previous uh, branching random walk model. So for those who know what branching Brownian motion is, this is really, a, this is a similar process. I mean, it has this analogous covariant structure. And, uh, and about the measure, so as I said, they are singular continuous, and, and in fact, they, are, um, they have a property which made them interesting, at least in the beginning. Uh, that's why they were considered, because they are known as multifractal. Uh, multifractal means that you have this, uh, this rule for moments. So if you take just a ball, uh, or here it's a ball, uh, sorry. This is here the set, uh, you know, a ball around X of radius R. Then, uh, if you look at the Q's moment, then it's uh, it's quadratic in Q. So you have this, this nice quadratic polynomial here, uh, and and it's it's in opposition. Uh, for example, if you something you might be familiar with is if you take a, a Brownian motion, and you look at at the moment uh, of BT, right, uh, in in 1D, of course, then this would uh, this would just be like. Uh, uh, for example, uh, t to the q over 2, I guess, or something like that. There's a constant. And uh, and this is monofractal. It's linear in q, while this one is, is quadratic. This is what it's called multifractal. And, and uh, the exponent depends on this parameter gamma. So this relationship. Anyway, uh, the multifractal character of this measure is due to the fact that there is this sort of geometry here, you know, very large spike and then some I mean, zero almost everywhere, etc. Okay. So 
In fact, uh, because I'm interested in the maximum, I want to understand the measure, the support of those measures a bit better than just uh, it's in terms of its dimension. So, so the question you can ask is, is where does this measure really live? Uh, and uh, and okay, so to to answer this, I, I introduced a concept which is known as um, as stick points. Uh, so this would be these are called stick points in the literature. And um, and uh, so so let me recall that if you look at the variance uh, of the field, then it's of order it diverges like log of epsilon. Uh, and uh, and in particular here you look at the point which are uh, gamma uh, times the variance. So this is uh, this is very atypical points because you know for a Gaussian uh, typically you will be of the square root. I mean you you are of the order of the standard deviation. So square root log epsilon here you add you ask to be the field to be of order of the variance, so there will be very few such points. And uh, and the claim is that in fact uh, the dimension it's known in general the dimension of such point is just uh, d minus gamma square uh, divided by two. Uh, if if and 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 this set is actually empty if uh, gamma is is greater than square root two d. So this is again the critical value we have seen before. Okay, and uh, and what I want to say is that uh, okay, so in fact it's uh, okay, so let me I don't know I should should go here yes so there are two I mean well the one result I can make is that I can prove is that in probability if you look at the maximum so this was our original question what is the maximum of this function uh, it behaves like log epsilon and then the limit uh, is a critical value. And why is that? Because you can actually prove this claim here. You can prove that the support of the measure uh, of the GMC measure is uh, is contained in in two in between two uh, different set of stick points. Uh, it includes all the set with gamma minus uh, delta and uh, and not I mean and and, uh, and vice versa. It doesn't contain any points uh, which are. Uh, does that make sense? Or did I? Do the inequality wrong? No, I think that's okay. Uh, and uh, well, in any case, so because those sets are empty, you you deduce that the, that the, there are points. I mean, those sets, you know, they have a positive out of dimension in the subcritical regime, so there are points uh, in the support. So the measure is non-trivial in this case, and vice versa, because the sets are empty for gamma greater than square root two d, there are no such points. So this is how you deduce more or less that. Uh, this is claim for the maximum just from GMT. There are other way to prove this, of course, uh, using some second moment method, but uh, but this is one way you can get a hold of the maximum using GMC theory. And uh, and in fact, there is a conjecture, which is sort of, uh, I mean, that you can make, uh, I'm not very being very precise here, but what, what I mean is that uh, if you look at the Lebesgue measure, so this is the Lebesgue measure of this set of tip points, and you normalize it by its expectation, then it should converge exactly to the mass of the measure. So those measures are non-trivial, they have a positive mass almost surely, and, and this limit should be true. Okay, so the main uh, sort of example here of a lot of field, uh, and that's why I choose to, to discuss uh, things in 2D, is really the, the two-dimensional Gaussian free field. So this is really what I want to discuss now. Uh, I imagine many of you have heard this name. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a, a definition and, and a couple of uh, way you can think about that. So the the point is that if you have a, a simply connected domain in the plane, uh, you can associate to it uh, a generalized uh, Gaussian function. So generalized in the sense that it, it will be a random distribution. And, uh, and again, it's correlated. Uh, its correlation kernel is the green function uh, of the domain. So the, the green function means that uh, if you look at minus Laplace, uh, uh, minus Laplace of GD of, you take Laplace in W, let's say, W, this is a, a constant which uh, C, which depends only on the dimension, time uh, Dirac mass at Z. Okay, so this is uh, more or less the solution of this uh, this equation here. 
so the fundamental solution of the Laplace equation, and you, and you impose some boundary condition uh, on on the the boundary of your domain, which you can assume is a nice curve, uh, and uh, and this is a uh, okay. Here I'm considering Neumann boundary condition, um, so okay. So that means that the partial derivative is zero uh, along the boundary. And, uh, okay. It turned out that this green function here you can show because in 2D uh, this green function will be behave like the Newton kernel, so it will be like a log. So in 2D with my normalization, uh, this will be like log plus some terms that actually you you know exactly what they are. But the point is that this has a singularity on the diagonal of logarithmic time, so this is again an example of a log-correlated field. Uh, and, and, and this is an important example, as I said, because it has some additional property of that just being log-correlated. It turns out that uh, this process is conformally invariant and has a domain Markov property. So you can, if you have never encountered the Gaussian free field, you can think of this as being somehow 2D analog. I mean, not analog because the two-dimensional Brownian motion exists, but the 2D uh, counterpart of Brownian motion, in the sense that it's a natural process which will, uh, I mean, Brownian motion is both scale invariant and has independent increment. This process, you replace scale invariance by conformal invariance and uh, independent increments by the domain Markov property. So domain Markov property means the following. So for example, if you have a GFF in the disk, xd and you take a, a, a subdomain d then uh, if you look at xd uh, you can decompose it like uh, a field uh, x small d or maybe I, I should not have 2d it's too complicated let's call this one a you can just write it like this xa where this is a, a gff on a with Dirichlet boundary condition, so zero boundary condition, and then plus uh, an harmonic function. Uh, and, uh, and the two are independent. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is what you can do. And this decomposition is valid in, in A, of course. So this is uh, the domain Markov property. I mean, this, this function is smooth. It's, it's, and uh, okay, this is like four. Okay. So, right. Uh, conformally invariant means that uh, if, if I have a two domain, maybe I should explain this D1 and D2. Maybe one can be the disk, in fact, and the unit disk. And a map uh, phi, which is conformal in between, then if I look at uh, xd composed with phi, uh, I guess I want phi inverse like this, then this is just uh, xd in distribution. Okay, so this is what, what those two properties means. Okay, anyway. This, this makes this process, in fact, this is the only uh, process up to some moments condition with these two property, so it's very natural. Uh, and and uh, conformal invariance allow you to, uh, to only talk about the process. If you want to understand the property of the process, you can just work in the unit disk. Oh, sorry. Uh, you can just work in the unit disk because by conformal invariance, you then know the distribution in any domain. And in this case, the covariance, uh, this uh, this nice, this green function has this very nice expression. I mean, it's very simple, uh, and uh, and you can really check from this covariance formula that uh, if you test uh, against any any function uh, x, so you, you by test I mean you compute this this integral, uh, you know, as, as you would do, then this is uh, if, if you want this is uh, yeah in the sense of distribution, then this is a normal with a certain variance which is given by this uh, this somehow H1 norm of F. Well, in fact, you need F hat because you need, uh, so F hat, this is the harmonic extension, it's equal to F on the domain and it's extended harmonically outside. Uh, once you know the value on the boundary, there is a unique harmonic extension which uh, tends to zero at infinity, and this is the one you should consider. This comes from the Neumann boundary condition. Buying the boundary condition change 
slightly the H1 norm you have to consider. Okay, but uh, this formula will come up again when we see the Gini ensemble, so you can, uh, uh, you will recognize it. Okay, and, uh, and, and okay, so this process exists, you can construct it very, uh, very easily as a Fourier series, in fact, just like, you know, there's one construction of Brownian motion along the same line, you just take a sequence of IID standard Gaussian and an orthonormal basis. So in this case, you choose the one with respect to this inner product uh, coming from this H1 norm. And uh, and then this, uh, here's the inner product. And if you do this, this series, this gives you a GFF. Uh, okay. So, okay, so this is a, because this process has nice property, but it's also important because it, it comes in in many, in the scaling limit of many different models. Just like Brownian motion in 1D comes as a scaling limit of random walk and other processes which are not exactly random walk, but erase to it. So here's a list that uh, in this context of random matrices you might have uh, already heard of. So uh, of course there is a discrete model called the, the discrete Gaussian free field, uh, which is a natural uh, way to consider that. It's just a lattice model with independent uh, Gaussian on, on increments on each edge modulo the geometry of the lattice and then, uh, okay. You can consider that for any lattice, it's a large family of models. Uh, another large family of models which gives rise to some Gaussian free field are dimer models. Uh, so in general, uh, random tiling models, uh, you know, can do that. So he let me illustrate here uh, what I mean uh, if you have never seen this. So a dimer model uh, is just a perfect matching of a bit part of graph, so here you have some graph uh, which is hexagonal shape, and then you do a, a perfect matching uniformly at random. And, and okay, if you, uh, if you, you can see, you can just associate to, uh, you know, there are three possible orientation here, that's why the hexagon is nice. You can just associate a color to them, like this would be this, uh, this flat, and then, yeah, this would be the, the color, and I should not, right here in orange. Okay, anyway, it's uh, just a correspondence here, a way to, re to to view this thing, but you can also view it as some sort of a box in a, in a tree diagon, I mean, in a, in 3D, 3D space, right? And this uh, this is like a box piling, exactly like we saw in the first picture, and if you remove the mean, the fluctuation uh, of this, this type, type of, uh, of box piling are given by the GFF. This is the result of Kenyon, uh, I think at first, and some other people have studied that for different geometry and different type of dimers or tiling models, more general tiling models. Um, I don't have a picture, I should have put one. Uh, if you consider non-intersecting random walk and it, you can also associate a height function to them, each time you cross a line, you increase your function by one. And again, the fluctuation of those type of picture are governed by the 2D GFF uh, in a certain domain. Uh, there is, of course, uh, some planar maps. Uh, if you, I mean, people may be more familiar with uh, with 2D uh, discrete geometry knows that well. You know, if you have a, a, a planar map uh, and you associate a natural measure to it by putting mass one to every face or something like that, then those uh, those I mean those relate to uh, the Gaussian free field and, and also to GMC. Uh, and, and also the one of the examples that I really want to uh, talk about today, in fact, it's, uh, it's a characteristic polynomial of, uh, of non-emission random matrices. So uh, then, then also the GFF. So this, this I will explain in, in more details. Uh, okay, right. So yeah, ah, okay. This is an important remark. All these processes are non-Gaussian. So uh, the discrete Gaussian free field is, is, is non-Gaussian. I mean, all, all of those are uh, naturally non-Gaussian. I mean, what was the log of a characteristic polynomial uh, be a Gaussian process? So in particular, this theorem, this very nice theorem of uh, Robert and Vargas that I talked about, where is it? Uh, it was before that. Yes, this is uh, this theorem here uh, that I discussed it doesn't apply in this case. So you see, if you okay, if you think of uh, x epsilon as being your process, uh, epsilon is now the size of your lattice or a natural parameter. 
like the dimension of your matrix, then uh, you would like to prove a similar statement that you have a convergence to GMC, but the problem is that the process are non-Gaussian, so you cannot apply this, this result directly because this is valid for Gaussian processes. So what I want to explain is, is a way you can do this for characteristic polynomial of random matrices. And my main example is going to be the Ginebra ensemble. So uh, let me recall the definition. So a Ginebra matrix is, is, a, is an n by n matrix with independent uh, Gaussian entries. So and they are complex. And I take this normalization that the variance is one over square root of n, uh, and I denote by lambda the uh, eigenvalue. I have n of them. This normalization here I took because uh, because then the eigenvalue lives in the unit disk. Uh, so this is a, a natural one. So and this is a typical picture of of what it looks like. Uh, so as uh, to to make the link with Milan talks this morning, this is uh, like uh, I mean you see this sort of uh, this is more. Uh, this doesn't look like a Poisson process. I mean, this has this hyper uniformity features that uh, the points somehow repel each other and are much more nicely distributed than uh, if you have a Poisson process. Okay, and and there are very few points which uh, actually exceed this disk. And and in fact, it's a it's a theorem. I don't know if I, yeah I stated so. This goes back to Geneva in the 60s, and it's it's a theorem that uh, if you look at the distribution of points. So one way to, to look at that is to form a, an empirical measure out of it. So you put the arc mass at uh, each one of the point, and then uh, uh, if you look at this here, uh, okay, I'm trying to copy, well, whatever. This is just. Uh, equal to the integral uh, of f again d mu n okay so anyway what i want to say is that so uh, this theor you have this theorem that uh, you can reformulate in the following way that mu n converge to sigma uh, i mean let's say almost surely uh, it 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 holds with overwhelming probability there is even a large deviation principle which uh, tell you how you know how much mu n can deviate from sigma, uh, and and this sigma is called the circular law. It's uniform on this disk. And uh, what we want to consider uh, now is what are the fluctuate. I mean, the fluctuation of mu n around the circular law. Uh, and this question, uh, this paper was also mentioned this morning, was uh, somehow looked at in the 2000 by Ryder and Virag, and uh, what they showed is that so here it's just i mean it, it's again uh, so this is like uh, you you look at the linear statistics that is the sum of uh, f tested against every eigenvalue you center it by the circular law uh, so this is uh, again this circular law and then this is converged to uh, a gaussian in the limit so this is a central limit theorem uh, and the variance here is this, uh, we recognize again this H1 norm. Uh, and uh, so this, this makes the link to the GFF. I will, uh, I will be more precise in a moment. Uh, what I want to just comment on is that there is no normalization here. I mean, you just uh, recenter, but uh, you don't divide by one over square root of n, like in the usual CLT, it really converge without any normalization. So it's, it's kind of a strange fact. Uh, in any case, uh, the interpretation in terms of the Gaussian free field is the following. So you can just uh, uh, so so you define this function uh, theta here, which is uh, the logarithmic potential of the circular law. This is what you will need to to recenter by, and then you you look at the psi n I define as a log uh, of the absolute value of the characteristic polynomial. Uh, and and this is here just a centering term. This uh, okay, so maybe I should write this formula at least once. So you can view really psi n as just a sum, you know, because it's a log of the characteristic polynomial. Uh, you can just rewrite it like this. 
uh, minus well and let me write it like this so that it's more clear okay so this is really uh, of this type uh, and uh, and in fact if you take its laplacian uh, because of the this is a the log is uh, somehow the 2D uh, Coulomb kernel. Then you just get this nice formula that you can recover the measure by taking the Laplacian. Uh, and it's recentered by the circular law. Uh, the other interpretation of this function psi n is you can view that as, uh, I mean, in this form, this is the electric field generated by the eigenvalue on the one side minus the one generated by the circular law. Uh, so there's an electrical, uh, uh, electrostatic interpretation. And uh, you can just, this theorem is more or less equivalent to saying that, uh, well, the integral of psi n as a distribution now tested against the application of f con converged to this uh, object where x is uh, again this Neumann GFF that I uh, presented. So this is a, a way you can view rider Virax it's in the original article as a convergence of the log characteristic polynomial of the electric field to the GFF. Uh, so this is how, how the GFF naturally arrives uh, in random matrix theory, for example. And, uh, and this is true not only for Gini, but uh, this type of convergence of CLT are true for uh, many other distributions. So Wigner matrices, with independent complex valued entries, uh, although this is true uh, in quite generality. Okay, so what I want to study here is the log characteristic polynomial. So this function psi n here. Uh, and here is uh, what it looked like as a plot. Uh, so it's, it, okay, it, it's rough, but not so much. Uh, it's roughly, it's, it's of low order. Uh, in fact, this should be like log of a thousand divided by two, I guess, it's about four. Uh, and, uh, and uh, okay, below the picture, it's much more rough because there are all the eigenvalue which uh, create those very deep uh, well. Uh, anyway, the theorem, oops, that should be square root two. Uh, the theorem is the following, uh, or the conjecture, sorry, uh, is that, uh, if uh, if you look at the maximum of this function uh, on the unit disk, in fact, you can replace this by C because the maximum is almost, I mean, you can show it's the same. Uh, then it's, it behaves like log n again. So this, uh, uh, this is, uh, okay. Well, I will comment on that. Plus three quarter log log n. And then uh, this, if you recenter this way, this should converge to some, uh, random variable with a specific uh, distribution. So it's a gamble with a random mean. Uh, I won't say, I, I can say more, but uh, I will not. Uh, so the, the point is that, uh, okay, this, uh, this is really to be expected uh, that it behave like log n, uh, and this is what I want to discuss today. Uh, I want to give a proof of that or explain uh, how you can get this, this log n. Uh, the the three quarter here is really specific to uh, to log correlated fields. To have this three quarter log log n correction is really something which is uh, somehow universal. I mean, not universal because it's not, but as certain universality. Uh, I mean, it's it's it arises for many log correlated fields, uh, not all of them, but uh, anyway. So it is a conjecture. Yes. So, so you said you, you won't talk about it, but uh, this random mean uh, of uh, Xi, is it known explicitly or uh, we just know that th uh, there should be something? Yes, so so Xi should be a gamble plus a constant, deterministic constant, plus uh, I guess in this normalization log Z, where Z is the integral uh, over the disk of mu critical. Uh, so by critical, I mean uh, you take gamma equal to the critical value. I, I haven't explained how you 
renormalize this one, but but it's what it should be. So this is a random variable. This uh, this is a positive random variable almost surely. So it has no moment, uh, but this is uh, the conjecture. This uh, so it's known to some extent. I mean because uh, this this sort of structure is always known. This constant is usually uh, very much unknown. Even for branching one or more, people don't have any idea. I mean maybe it does no nice value in fact. Uh, but this 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 is what uh, you, you can conjecture. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, yes, and and just okay. So how do you get to this conjecture? The the rational is somehow that uh, you really make an analogy with a log correlated field, a Gaussian one. So you just replace pi n by x epsilon. Uh, where X would be the GFF with Neumann condition, so the field uh, which arises in the limit, and it's modified as a micro microscopic scale. So I choose you choose epsilon to be uh, the this is the distance between the eigenvalue in the bulk, the typical distance uh, in the bulk. Okay, and if you if you do that, then you can uh, and and you know everything is known about this conjecture is known for X epsilon. You just replace and and you get this this formula. Uh, okay. Uh, so now, okay, you can associate to that to this field psi n a Gaussian multiplicative chaos uh, because it's log correlated, so it it makes sense, and and it's it's again the same formula. You take the exponential uh, and you renormalize by its expectation. It's pretty nice in the case of log characteristic polynomial because what you look at is just uh, now a moment of the characteristic polynomial so to be normalized. Uh, and you you want to know, okay, I mean, the, the conjecture you can make again uh, is that this will converge to some GMC measure uh, associated with X, where this is the Neumann GFF. Okay, and, and in fact, uh, there is some work in progress on this. Uh, uh, hopefully, this will be proved soon that this is a subcritical regime. And uh, and okay, you can suppose that this 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 convergence with all now it's in distribution, of course. Uh, in fact, how I define things is not even clear that those objects uh, are they are not defined on the same probability space. I mean, for each n, I have a different values, so I can only com talk about convergence in distribution. Um, and and this measure is the same one as the one you if you apply the Robert Vargas theorem to the Neumann GFF. Right? Then this is the the same limiting measure. Okay. And here is a, a plot of what it looked like for uh, for the characteristic polynomial. So it's it's really the characteristic poly absolute value of the characteristic polynomial divided by its expectation uh, uh, for uh, it's the expectation is kind of known. Uh, I mean, so for n is three thousand. This is uh, somehow the what you see. So it doesn't look quite like the bar. I mean, it looks reasonably similar to the picture I showed with the box at the beginning. I mean, those sort of large spice arising and, and zero everywhere. Okay. So the, the main result I want to show is some conversion to multiplicative chaos, but I'm cheating a bit. Uh, so let me first recall how this was constructed in the Gaussian case. So you again uh, choose a modifier, so a, a smooth pro probability density function that you rescale at scale epsilon. Uh, and then you convolve uh, the field with it, okay? So to make it smooth. Uh, now you have a continuous Gaussian function, you can take it exponential and, and, and the GMC measure is just defined as this limit here, which exists uh, for gamma less than square root 2D. So in this case, less than two. Uh, and uh, and here is how I cheat. So uh, I, I take the psi n, which is a log characteristic polynomial, and I also modify it by a uh, by, uh, uh, same phi, uh, also a modifier, except that now I will take epsilon also depending on n. Uh, and I choose epsilon to be uh, this, uh, this particular value here with a tiny delta positive. If I didn't add the delta, so if delta is zero, this is a microscopic scale, and then it's like I do nothing because uh, psi n is already smooth at the microscopic scale, so I, I wouldn't change the function. 
by by adding the delta i regularize it a bit which uh, makes the analysis much simpler but one of the so in, one of the interests of this article in fact maybe the main one is to show that adding this small delta doesn't change anything to the result uh, you you can still get conversions to gmc i mean that's not surprising but you can still recover the maximum and the sick points even with a small delta here so uh, and uh, okay so in this case the critical value is actually square root of eight because uh, let me just comment on that for a moment uh, why it's not two it's not two because uh, oh, where is the writer of virax theorem here it is because there is a one half here uh, so this slightly changes all the constant uh, anyway uh, so the critical value is square root of eight uh, and uh, and you form this measure so phi n is now the the characteristic polynomial with a small regularization meaning a delta uh, very small and then you can show you can in this case prove that you get the gmc measure and the limit uh, and uh, and as i said it doesn't change the behavior of the maximum or the stick points i mean so for example in the case of the characteristic polynomial those are the stick points that's exactly the same definition as in the gaussian case uh, except that i took the exponential so this is just the debt is greater than so this is the mean contribution you should sort of forget about this it needs to be there but it's just the fact that the debt is greater than n to some power gamma and you want to know what is the size of this set uh, ideally you would like to know more than just its size you know what what are its property uh, but anyway the theorem i can get uh, is that if you look at the size of this set of six points uh, it's of order n to the minus gamma square over eight uh, okay you you have convergence in probability yeah, in a sense uh, so for any small delta this, this will converge to one uh, and this is true throughout the subcritical phase you can actually show without much effort that if gamma uh, you could put yeah that if okay gamma is positive here i guess so that if gamma is strictly greater than greater than equal solid and square root of eight this this will converge to zero in the end uh, and you can also recover the maximum so so this is uh, the first order in the in the conjecture that i show so if you divide by log n then it converts to the the correct constant right and uh, and now i want to explain uh, how you can uh, arrive at this result uh, so uh, very briefly i mean one slide on the id uh, the point is so you see everywhere you take uh, exponential of of some some processes this is always what you do in gmc so the information you would need to have is some sorry information about the laplace transform of the the field in a sense and and the general idea is that you will need to obtain uh, asymptotics for the laplace transform of the field and uh, and then you you will use this asymptotic to make some comparison with the uh, branching processes and then you know for branching processes we know what happened we understand very well how uh, how to get hold of the maximum and so on so once you can compare then you will be done basically and uh, and at the random matrix level the challenge is really to obtain this these asymptotics for the laplace transform uh, and that's where the regularization plays an important role i mean so in general uh i mean this this think of xn just as being cyan i mean if you do the computation you will just find that this formula is true so it is log correlated and then there is a microscopic scale enter into play as a regularization scale i mean where uh, it's smoothed out uh, so this is the setting you consider so you have this setting and then you will need to show two things uh, to basically apply our general theorem the first thing is just a, a sort of tightness estimate if you want you need an upper bound on the laplace transform so that it it diverges like n to some specific power which depend on the dimension and uh, and gamma the constant don't matter you can it can be whatever but but you need this specific uh, thing and the second result uh, that you, the second type of asymptotic that you need is uh, is uh, ratios of laplace transform so you need to show that those ratios are roughly gaussian so let me explain what what i have here forget about the red term for now uh, you look at this sort of ratio and then you show that so this is a gaussian term you see it's quadratic in gamma uh, and this is the 
interaction between the red term and the and the gamma one gamma two so this is again quadratic if you want one for phi n and one for gamma and then that's uh, the variance coming from the red term here uh, and 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 this uh, this uh, this sigma here is really the covariance of the limiting field so remember we have that xn converged to x so sigma here is the, the limit of the covariance of the the field and uh, okay and this is how it goes and uh, and what you need on the side i mean it's not enough to have a two point laplace transform in a sense you need two point laplace transform plus a smooth part so phi n here is can be a smooth function uh, which is at scale epsilon uh, where again I have this delta. So this is a, and if you control, okay, so my bottom line is if one and two hold, then you can get conversions to GMC. So we have a general theorem uh, that we proved uh, a couple of years ago, which is that indeed, if, if you have those two condition, uh, then throughout the subcritical phase, you get convergence. So it's valid even if the field is not Gaussian, but only have those type of Gaussian asymptotics. Um, and this is this result we apply to the to the Ginebra, or I apply to the Ginebra. Uh, let me mention another result that we proved also recently, is that under the same condition, uh, you can get all of the sig points. So if you look at the point where the field is large, uh, then it has the correct dimension, more or less. Uh, this old uh, in the sense that I showed before, in probability as n tends to infinity. And uh, and you can also get convergence of the maximum. So all uh, all is about uh, yeah. This is more or less what you need. And uh, and just let me finish by uh, discussing maybe some how you apply this method, this general method to the GM uh, to the Gini block characteristic polynomial. Uh, so for one, you know the just sort of tightness statement of the bond on the first uh, on the Laplace transform. Uh, it, it is actually an asymptotic, so it's a result, a recent result of Christian Webb and, and Modic Wong. Uh, so they they get this result um, using some Riemann Hilbert technique. Uh, so this is for the the psi n is the log det here, and then I, I put the square root of two just to have the usual normalization. I mean, uh, and uh, yes, and then okay, so so the point is how do you prove uh, this second condition here? Uh, which I I have massacred. Let me clean it. How do you get this type of asymptotics? Uh, and and the problem is that uh, the log characteristic polynomial is singular. It has a logarithmic singularity, so this is quite difficult, uh, especially that you want this in the regime where this is something I haven't emphasized. You need this in the regime where the point merge, uh, and this is quite sophisticated if you have ever done. Riemann here, but asymptotics, this is a challenging uh, problem, uh, especially for the genome where the Riemann Hilbert problem is, uh, is in this case, I think four by four. Anyway, uh, this is not simple. So, what you, this is where I use this, uh, this cheating that I, I, I modify the field. Uh, so, so remember this is phi n is just uh, equal to psi n. Uh, modified with a certain cutoff at scale epsilon n, and epsilon n is n minus one half plus delta. And once I introduce for this one, this one is smooth uh, above the microscopic scale, and this makes my life much easier. Uh, the reason for that is that, uh, okay, so this is what it's explained here. If I denote by mu n tilde as a recentered empirical measure, then the field phi n that I just uh, reviewed is just a, a smooth linear statistic now, mesoscopic at scale epsilon minus one. So, so what you need to do now is just a mesoscopic LT. I mean, this will give you uh, directly the asymptotic I, I explained before. Uh, and this, this makes the problem much more easy because uh, there are many tools to prove mesoscopic statistic, uh, mesoscopic CLT in, in, in random matrix theory. I mean. This function omega is just uh, the log convoluted with phi, so it's it's a very nice function. I mean, it's uh, it grows only logarithmically. Uh, it is uh, completely smooth. So, uh, right. And uh, okay, and just two on the 
two, one slide on the technical tools. So what I use to prove the CLT, as I said, there are many tools available. Uh, one one ingredient that I use for the Gini ensemble is that it's a determinant or point process. So Milan talked a bit about it. Uh, the point for me is that you have a nice formula for the Laplace transform of any linear statistic in terms of freedom determinants. And, uh, and the freedom determinants only involve the kernel, if you want. And the Geneva kernel is, is extremely simple. Uh, I won't write it down uh, for time reasons, but uh, uh, it, it's just very simple. So you can, this is a simple tool to use. Another nice tool you can use is the Coulomb gas picture. So uh, you can view the eigenvalue of Geneva as a Coulomb gas. So I, that, that is the, the joint distribution is exponential of minus an energy, which is just of this form here and Q is quadratic. Uh, the point is that, uh, okay, I mean, I don't want to enter into the details, but once you have a Coulomb gas, you can use uh, Johansson's uh, loop equation method. I can say more if you have question about that uh, to prove a CLT. And that's basically one, one thing I did in the paper is to uh, apply this method uh, at mesoscopic scale. So it was it has been used before in the global setting by Ammer, uh, Eden Malm, and Makarov. That was in 2015 in AOP. And then you can actually uh, do the same type of things in mesoscopic scale. You just have to be much more careful in controlling the error term. So now I have lots of things I want to skip. Uh, yes. So I just want to discuss some a few other applications. So let me go to the full list. Yes. So just to conclude some, uh, I mean, you, I, I showed you a general uh, result that if you have this sort of condition one and two, then you get conversions to GMC. This has been applied uh, to other ensemble as well as the Geneva ensemble. So in fact, the first application was for the circular unitary ensemble. It's always the case. It's a very simple model by Nicola, Saxman, and Webb. Uh, and there you can get the asymptotics without any regularization uh, using the Riemann Hilbert machinery uh, for the determinants. So uh, in other words, the work of Deitz uh, is Krasovsky and Krasovsky and Clays. So this is a for the circular unity ensemble. I have some application for circular beta ensemble, uh, also based on loop equation. Uh, and and we have uh, recently, we had an application for GUE and uh, in fact, uh, any one cut regular unitary ensemble. Uh, and here we use orthogonal polynomials uh, and Riemann Hilbert uh, analysis. So I won't enter into the detail. Let me just present to you uh, one of the results uh, that we obtained. So, so I, I only talk about GUE, but this is valid for more general ensemble, but GUE is maybe the most well-known one. So now what you look at is a counting function. So you count the number of eigenvalue less than a given uh, number, and you recenter it by the semicircular law. So this is the density of state, if you want, uh, of the GUE. And in my normalization, I should have precise, it's, it's just this this. Uh, this uh, this measure okay and uh, and and so the support is minus one one that's where the eigenvalue of my GUE lives and I just uh, look at the counting function I should have shown a picture uh, well the point of the counting function is just like uh, I mean is, is that it will converge uh, in distribution uh, to some uh, limiting field which is uh, again log correlated I mean here you have the formula it's just uh, this has to do with the geometry on minus one one. Okay, but uh, so you can ask the question whether if you take the exponential of gamma times this counting function, it converts to a GMC. And this is uh, one of our results. The answer is yes, you get convergence in, uh, in low. Again, the limiting measure is associated with this field H infinity. Uh, the measure is non-trivial in the subcritical regime. And, uh, and again, you get the convergence of the maximum and minimum. Uh, okay, the reason I'm presenting this theorem is because you have a nice corollary. Uh, so the corollary is that 
and this was our motivation to in fact look that this uh, counting function is a, is an optimal rate of convergence to the semicircular law. So uh, and and also uh, related to it, it's optimal rigidity. That's not the same rigidity as this morning. I, I apologize for that. Uh, so by optimal rate, so let me present the result. So in fact, um, you see, just I mean, okay. So if you maybe, maybe I don't rewrite it, but if you look at H n, this is the difference of the eigenvalue counting function minus the semicircular law. So in fact. Uh, Modulo uh, normalization, one over n times the max of Hn is just a normal, it's a distance, it's a statistical distance called the kolmogorov smirnov distance between the two measures. Uh, it's very much used in, in 1D statistics, I mean. Uh, and, uh, and, and so this is another interpretation of the maximum. It's just this distance and then our result, uh, with a bit of work, you can show it's equivalent to, to, to uh, to show that this distance uh, between the so this is the empirical measure and that the semicircular law is uh, is exactly of order log n over n divided by one over p. I mean this is the this is optimal because uh, it's true for any optimal. So we have the rate of convergence and uh, equivalently you get an optimal rigidity result. So just let me conclude with this that if you define the gamma to be uh, the kappa to be the quantile of the semicircular law, then the fluctuation of the eigenvalue, so that's the eigenvalue here, around the quantile, or classical location sometimes, they are extremely small. I mean, they are just of order also log n over n. So, so the eigenvalues, they deviate from some deterministic number by just a very tiny amount, uh, with probability going to one. Uh, so, and that's that's what's sometimes called, I mean, that's what's called rigidity. It's not the same as in Mill and Stokes, but that's another form of rigidity. Uh, okay, so thank you. Thank you, Gauthier. Are there some questions? I have one question to to start. Um, so. In, if you take, for instance, the, the Coulomb gas uh, picture, you, you can in 2D you, you can uh, you can vary the potential, you can vary the strength of the repulsion. So yes. how universal or expected the, the convergence to to uh, Gaussian multiplicity oh, chaos? It's supposed to be really universal. I mean, uh, so by varying the potential, you ma okay. So this is a trick question. I mean. Uh, so let's assume. So if you assume that. Uh, I don't know where I wrote the Coulomb gas model it was before. So, where is the Coulomb gas? Uh, just hold on. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yes, so indeed, uh, you can put, uh, you can put, a, okay, uh, several things you can do. You can put, uh, let me put it in red, the beta here, and uh, and var is a q. Uh, so if you var q, uh, and uh, let's say the the eigenvalue lives in a connected set, then uh, this should not change anything. Uh, the what I don't know what happened is what happened if you have two. Imagine you you would have two different disjoint uh, components in the support of the equilibrium measure. So then I don't know if there are extra phenomena or if you get some sort of GFF associated with the Riemann surface. I mean that that I don't know. But let's say if the droplet remains simply connected, then uh, nothing should change. And in fact, it's possible to prove I think. And and if beta is general, uh, all that change is a critical value. Um, the critical value become uh, is in general two over square root beta, I think. 
uh, no wait, two times square root beta in 2D. Uh, so it, it only changed because uh, this only changed the variance of the GFF in a sense. Uh, so those results are supposed to be uh, uh, universal. I, I have an, another question about what you presented. So you, you, you presented a method of proof for uh, uh, specifically for well, tr taking the example of the of Ginebra, and and then yes. there, there was a slide with other applications, and you mentioned also C C CUE and uh, G GUE, but but these are one dimensional. Well, the Dagen values live on a one dimensional thing. So what the, what you what you your point is that the 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 scheme of proof is the same. And, yeah, uh, it's really the same. Uh, er everything is more or less an application of this, uh, of this. Uh, ah, where is it? Yeah, everything is more or less an application of this theorem. I mean, uh, the the technical difference is how you check the condition one and two. I mean, uh, so yes, but this theorem just makes a comparison with. Uh, this is where we do the comparison with the branching one and more. There are not really any application in this paper. It's just uh, we show that if you have those two conditions uh, on the moment, then uh, even if your field is not Gaussian, then it will converge to, uh, to GMC. So this is sort of a, if you want this, this, this result is, is sort of a universality result. It says that even if your field is non-Gaussian, but you get certain Gaussian asymptotics for the Laplace transform, then uh, you will convert to GMC. I mean, uh, it might not be easy in practice to verify those two conditions. I mean, uh, because uh, yeah. typically, yeah, typically it's not not so simple. Uh, that's why it's mostly done for very integrable model. I mean. Are there other questions? Oh uh, yeah, I, I have one question uh, about the, the the fluctuations you mentioned in the Coulomb gas setting. You, you say you don't know what happens if you have two components, but it, it, yes. it, it's, it's not is it known what happens if uh, if the domain is not simply if the bulk bulk is not simply connected, for instance. Uh, yes, if it's not simply connected, the result of Hammer, Edelman, and Makarov just assumes the connectivity of the droplets. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. So this, this uh, for beta is equal to two. For general beta, I think I don't know what is uh, Leblay Safati. Uh, yeah, they have the best result, I think, in terms of assumption on the geometry of the droplet. I don't know if they assume simply connected or connected, but. Uh, okay. Okay, I, I will see. Thank you. Other questions? If not, let's uh, thank Gauthier again.